Before you can learn the trees, you have to learn the language of the trees. That's done indoors, out of a book, which, now you think of it, is one of the transformations of a tree. The words themselves are a delight to learn. You might be in a foreign land of terms, like Samara, Capsule, Droop, Legume, and Poem, where bark is papery, plated, warty, or smooth. But best of all are the words that shape the leaves, orbicular, caudate, cleft, and reniform, and their venation, pomade and parallel, and tips acute, truncate, auriculate. Sufficiently provided, you may now go forth to the forests and the shady streets to see how the chaos of experience answers to catalogue and category. Confusedly, the leaves of a single tree may differ among themselves more than they do from other species. So you have to find, all blandly says the book, an average leaf. Example, the catalpa in the book sprays out its leaves in whirls of three around the stem. The one in front of you, it really does, more somewhat, or almost. Maybe it's not catalpa, dreadful doubt. It may be weeks before you see an elm, fan-like in form, a spruce that pyramids, a sweet gum spiring up in steeple shape. Still, pay the tempt him, as Lucretius says, little by little you do start to learn, and learn as well, maybe, what language does, and how it does it, cutting across the world, not always at the joints, competing with experience while cooperating with experience, and keeping an obstinate intransigence, uncanny, of its own. Think finally about the secret will, pretending obedience to nature, but invidiously distinguishing everywhere, dividing up the world to conquer it. And think also how funny knowledge is. You may succeed in learning many trees, and calling off their names as you go by, but their comprehensive silence stays the same.